Hey guys, it's Libby. Welcome to my January wrap up. This month I finished seven things. They were one novel, one biography, one play, one collection of short stories, one audiobook, and then I DNF do books. Let's go ahead and start with the DNFs. So I actually DNF'd the first book I started this year, and that was The Game of Love and Death by Martha Brockenborough. This is a YA, fairly light fantasy about love and death who are personified as human-like things, um, and they play a game uh, in which they each pick a person and death wins if they either don't fall in love or if they die, and love wins if they like fall in love and live happily ever after within a set time. So it's just about them using some people in um, 1930s Seattle. And love picks a white boy and death picks a black girl, hoping that um, the state of race relations at the time will be enough of an impediment. So I read the first couple of chapters of this and I thought the characters of love and death were interesting, but I thought the two humans that they picked were like kind of pieces of cardboard. And I found the writing fairly ho-hum, sometimes cliched. And I decided that I did not want this to be the book that opened my year. Um, so some of y'all about to freak out, but what I did was I didn't just totally put it away. I like randomly opened to the middle of the book and read a chapter in two different places. <laughs> and I have to say, I liked the later parts. So I'm DNFing this for now, but I'm not going to get rid of it because I think I would like to give it another chance. Also, if you want to buy this book, can I just say that this edition, the Scholastic paperback edition, it's like not a very good printing. They didn't like, I don't know, something about the glue in the binding. It was just kind of annoying to hold open. So maybe get a different edition or just like go for the ebook of this. The next book that I DNF'd is not so lucky. I'm gonna be getting rid of it. That is Sorcerer to the Crown by Zen Cho, which I was quite excited about. Naomi Novik blurred this and she called it an enchanting cross between Georgette Hare and Susanna Clarke, full of delights and surprises. Um, I haven't read any Georgia Hare, but I have read Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. It is a great book and I love it. And I thought I was gonna get some more of that thing that that book is with this. And I, I did not, it fell far short. So like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, this is set um, at the beginning of the 19th century. Are the Napoleonic Wars involved? I think there's some Napoleonic War action going on in here. I don't know, I only read a couple of chapters. So it's set in the same time period as Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and it also has the same sort of academic feeling magic. There's a lot of sort of societies. In Sorcerer to the Crown, I think it's a little bit more institutionalized and like involved with the government, but there's also the problem that like people aren't really doing magic anymore. In Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, people aren't doing magic anymore because uh, no gentleman would do practical magic. I wore the right shirt for this. But in this, it's because England is running out of magic. And you know that England is running out of magic because Zen Cho tells you on every page. Page four. Has English thaumaturgy indeed been so reduced by the waning of England's magic that Sir Stephen believes we have nothing better to do? Page eight. Perhaps the last was not surprising in one who had entered into his office in such tragic circumstances and at a time when the affairs of English thaumaturgy were approaching an unprecedented crisis. Also on page 8, it cannot do any harm to ask him about your spells to arrest the decline of our magic. Page 11, there is the decline in our magic, said Zacharias. It is not surprising that my colleagues have linked our difficulties to my investiture. I read up to page 52 and the rate of such comments did not decline. In addition to that, the main characters were not great. We've got Zacharias With, who perhaps slightly inspired by Stephen Black from um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, is um, a black man in a position of power that people are not super comfortable with. So he has become the, uh, the Sorcerer Royal upon the death of his guardian, so he is the head of magic in England. And he is also a piece of cardboard. I think Zen Cho might have been going for stoic, but he just doesn't have a personality except for maybe just too, too good 
for this world. Just so nice. And then towards the end, in the last chapter that I read, we get introduced to the other main character who does have a name. But I don't remember what it is. If Zacharias was a piece of cardboard, then she is a piece of cardboard with the word feminist written on it. There were feminists in this time period, Mary Wollstonecraft, Charlotte Corday. So you can have feminists in historical fiction, but this was just like a lazy, like modern person put into the olden times. And I was not buying it, so. I gave up on this book. I'm DNFing it at two stars. I am going to get rid of it. Things were especially hard for Sorcerer to the Crown because as I was starting that book, I was finishing up The Miniaturist by Jesse Burton, um, which does do historical feminism really well. The characters aren't modern. The message isn't being spoon fed to you. You have to actually like use some critical cells in your brain. The Miniaturist was great. I gave it five stars, I gave it its own review if you want to know more. But for now I'm just gonna say really good historical fiction set in Golden Age Amsterdam. Um, it's about coming of age and learning about the adult world. Then I finished the first work of nonfiction that I've read in a while. It was a biography called The Infernal World of Branwell Bronte by Daphne du Maurier. Daphne du Maurier, of course, the author of such excellent books, my favorite book, Rebecca, and also my cousin Rachel. And this is actually the first biography that I've read since high school. I don't think I read any, you know, biography in college. Um, so I don't really know, like, how to rate or how to judge biography. So I will say I liked it. I don't know how much I can credit Daphne du Maurier for how good this is, because, like, most of it's just because, like, Brian Well had an interesting life. I learned a lot of things about him that I didn't know. Um, he was a Freemason, and also he didn't go to school. He stayed at home and was educated by his father, um, which is sort of ties into the thesis um, that Daphne du Maurier is kind of softly presenting in this book, um, which is that Branwell could not really distinguish fact from fiction. Branwell was not one of the cool kids. He was small in stature. He had like big, crazy, poofy red hair. And he was really intensely, maybe too much, into playing games of make-believe with his sisters, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, who were the ones who actually became famous. But because of all this, his father didn't want to send him to a public school, which, like, honestly may have been a good idea because, like, bullying was pretty bad in English boys' schools in the 19th century. He never really got socialized and he never really got a formal structure to, um, ex you know, express his talents for painting and writing. So in consequence, his painting was not quite good enough to get him in to an art school and his poems were not quite good enough to get published in a small periodical which could then lead to a larger publication. And so he just never really did anything with his life and this is a cycle that like fed back on itself and led to him creating what Daphne du Maurier is presenting as his alter ego, Alexander Percy. Um, who's a character that you see in his fiction, because even though he never published, he did write a lot of poetry and prose. And Alexander Percy was everything Branwell was not. He was, like, physically impressive and all the ladies loved him and he was, like, daring and had adventures and fought duels and had lots of mistresses. So for the most part, I found this very interesting. There was one thing that, like, <laughs> was just weird and a little bit ironic, and that is that Daphne du Maurier kind of casually throws out that Charlotte Bronte was gay. And to be honest, Charlotte Bronte is not like the last historical figure that I would believe was gay, but Daphne du Maurier doesn't present any evidence, and she talks about it like she has already presented evidence and like has made an argument that like we have reason to believe Charlotte Bronte was attracted to other women. But instead she just talks about how Charlotte would, um, like her siblings, 
write people that they knew into her fiction and Charlotte would cast her female friends as the lovers of the the male character that was representing herself. And this is particularly noteworthy because Daphne du Maurier nowadays uh, many people think that she was lesbian or bisexual, even though she at the time during her life said she was not and um, her children and the children of her supposed lover have said that like, no, our moms were not into each other. So it's a bit surprising that Daphne du Maurier would do something to someone else that she clearly did not want done to herself. I don't know guys, I gave this four stars. Okay, now let's talk about the audiobook that I read that was Castle Rack Rent by Mariah Edgeworth. This is quite a short novel from earlier in Mariah Edgeworth's career. It was published in 1800 um, and Mariah Edgeworth is generally cited as a contemporary of Jane Austen, although she did live longer than Jane Austen. Um, she continued to publish into the 1820s and 30s and it's possible that the book she wrote then after Austen had showed up on the literary scene were better, but her early books were not great. So Castle Rack Rent could have been interesting. It was published at quite a fraught political time when people were trying to decide whether Ireland would be incorporated into the United Kingdom, and by people I mean English people were trying to decide whether Ireland would be incorporated into the United Kingdom. Mariah Edgeworth was from an Anglo-Irish family, which means she was like ethnically English, but her family had long roots and an estate in Ireland. And Castle Rackrent is basically about how um, Anglo-Irish landlords like abused their land and their rights and the people who lived on land that they owned. However, even though this just barely edged into the 19th century, this is still a very 18th century feeling novel. Mariah Edgeworth doesn't take any time at the beginning to set up why we should be interested in these characters, and she's also not very good at identifying who her main character should be. So in Castle Rackrent, even though it's quite short, we see four different um, lords of the manor. They keep dying rather quickly and getting replaced by their like sons and cousins. Um, and it's narrated by the Irish steward of the estate and he basically talks about like all of the different ways that they were crap at just all of their jobs at, you know, stewardship, at, um, you know, family relations, like one of the guys just locked his wife in the attic for decades. But we never like learn anything about the steward and like his situation in life. So like I don't know why he was narrating and why we didn't just have a third person narrator because like the narrator she created, there was just nothing there. So I gave this a two out of five stars. Basically only read it if you have like an anthropological interest in this time period and this issue. Coming to the end, two things left. One is The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night by Jen Campbell, who is a booktuber that I'm subscribed to and I like her videos. I just thought that this was okay though. There are 12 short stories in this collection. I marked six of them as ones that I would read again and I think only one of those six was like really like a good interesting short story. So these are mainly all set in the modern day, but they have a bit of a feel of the whimsical and the fantastical. I do feel that I should mention that I don't read that many short stories, and the short story is not really my favorite type of writing. Um, the short stories that I do like are, are all like on the longer side and could um, more technically be classed as novelettes. So I'm much more likely to like something that like actually has a plot um, as opposed to sort of some musings. And several of the stories in here are, are of the musing variety and you just gotta hope that you're really into whatever the topic that they're musing about is. And so to talk about them all briefly, um, Animals was one that I did like. It set up an interesting world and had an interesting payoff. Um, Jacob was about nothing and I didn't care. Um, Plum Pie, Zombie Green, Yellow Bee, Purple Monster. Um, I didn't care for. It was narrated by a child and like short stories narrated by a child is generally not a winning combo for me. Um, In the Dark was one of the ones that was about nothing but I still found it interesting. 
Margaret and Mary and the End of the World is definitely the best in this collection. I think it's also the longest, so there is a correlation there for me. Um, it's about, it sort of looks at eating disorders through the lens of religious experience and like ways in which religious practice, historical and contemporary, can be like an eating disorder. Um, Little Deaths was one of the ones that wasn't about anything and I didn't care for it. Um, the Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night is written as a script um, and I did find that one fairly interesting. Um, Pebbles, I don't really remember that much about, but I marked that I enjoyed it, so I guess I enjoyed Pebbles. Um, Aunt Libby's Coffin Hotel, first off, winning title. There are not that many people named Libby in fiction, so I'm always excited to find one of those. Also, Aunt Libby. So, information about me, I have three half-brothers who are all much older than me, um, and so I became an aunt for the first time at age eight. I had been an aunt for more than two-thirds of my life, so I identify with that term. And I did end up liking this one. It's about um, scamming people based on their belief in an afterlife. And then the last three, Sea Devils, Human Satellites, and Bright White Hearts, I did not care for. I did notice one interesting thing about this book, um, and that is that, um, well, I was talking to Katie from Books and Things um, about her job, and, and what she does is Americanize texts that were written for British audiences, so just like switching around the words that we use. Um, and I got this book here at the Waterstones in Amsterdam, and Waterstones is a British book selling company. Bookstore. That's what I was going for. Book selling company. So this is the version of the book that was published in Britain. I don't know if it's been Americanized for publication in the States. But this felt incredibly British to me. And I guess that's because all of the British literature that I've been reading is either old, so I expect it to sound funny, or I've been reading an Americanized version of it. So basically the whole time I was reading this I was distinctly conscious that I was not the intended audience for this book. And even in one stories, which I think it was Sea Devils, um, I'm pretty sure it's set in the United States because of like the dialect that's written and like people are talking about going to Hollywood. But they use words like knickers instead of underwear and like vicar instead of pastor, I guess is what we use, preacher is what we use in the States. Um, so even though they were like, it was set in America, I was like, that is an English word right there. I don't think that was a bad experience, I just thought it was interesting and probably one that I'm going to have more now that I'm living in Europe and Britain is my local Anglophone area, culture creator. So I gave this book three stars and I feel bad about it. Finally, last thing is Troilus and Cressida by William Shakespeare. Only three to go now that I've finished this. I need to read Henry VIII, Edward III, and Two Noble Kinsmen. Um, so Troilus and Cressida, gosh it was an interesting play. Interesting both like in looking inside the text and outside the text. It is notoriously difficult to categorize. It's like a history tragicomedy based on mythology, and also Chaucer. This is one of Shakespeare's Love in a Time of War plays. This is set during the Trojan War, and Troilus and Cressida are actually on the same side. Um, it's not like Romeo and Juliet where, like, the Montagues and the Capulets are warring. Troilus and Cressida are both Trojans, but Cressida's father is a defector and has left and joined the Greeks, but Cressida is still living in Troy. And then our secondary plot, which is, you know, one of the most important secondary plots in a Shakespeare play. Like, if you didn't know that the title was Troilus and Cressida, you might think that it was the main plot. And that's basically an adapted version of the story of the Iliad, where Achilles refused to fight, refuses to fight for the Greeks, and then, um, uh, am I gonna spoil the Iliad for you? I'm spoiling the Iliad right now, guys! And then his friend Patroclus fights for him and dies, and then Achilles rejoins the battle in order to get revenge on Patroclus for Patroclus, not revenge on Patroclus. This play is so cynical. There's this one character, Thersites, who I think is a character that Shakespeare made up. Um, 
and he's one of the Greeks and he is basically just there to like be the cynical character. He basically just walks around saying everything is dumb, who cares? We have another character who does it on the Trojan side, Pandarus. And at the beginning of the play, you kind of maybe, like, have hope for his soul. <laughs> but he's actually got the closing speech, and he basically just says, Well, love's not real. I guess my life's purpose now is to set up meaningless sexual encounters. Oh, by the way, when I die, I bequeath to you all venereal disease. Now, I think I'm a fairly cynical person, but even I was like, damn, Shakespeare. I think instead of writing this play, maybe he needed to go to a therapist. Also... The bad thing, it's like one act too short. It needed another act. There were two really long stories that Shakespeare was trying to tell, and they kind of don't have an ending. Oh well, all the argument is a whore and a cuckold. I gave it four stars. And thanks to you guys for sitting through this very long January review. I've been filming for over an hour. I'm not sure how that happened. How did I talk so long? I think I'll be able to cut this down quite a bit. I have to pause whenever the bells ring because I live like right next to the palace and so the bells chime every 15 minutes. And sometimes they chime for like 90 seconds. So that's a not insignificant portion of each hour that is taken up by bells. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you later.